Hey, what's up, guys? Aaron here. So this is Fahrenheit's town hall they did today on Twitter all about mining. They went into the weeds on everything regarding mining profitability, calculating the value of mining, talking about U.S. Bitcoin Group and their experience, about profitability, efficiency. They went into the weeds about why this will be a really good thing for Nuco, how Nuco's balance sheet is really, really solid, and how this really positions us to do very, very well compared to the other miners in the space. Now this does go into the weeds a bit, but if you have any interest in the mining operation, that will be the main driver of profitability for the new co for Fahrenheit. I highly suggest that you watch this video and you listen to what they have to say. I know that many of you watching literally couldn't give two craps about what's going on with this new co. You just want your money back, etc. I totally get it. But if you have any interest and you want to know basically where you will most likely be an investor of or an investor in, I would highly recommend that you do watch this video. I have taken the time to include timestamps, but the first half to the first three quarters, I think really goes into everything that you need to know regarding what's going on with this new company. And before I go, I have not made a video on voting yet. Now I'm waiting for the lawyers for the UCC to make their instructional video. They said they're going to put one out. So I would be really, really stupid to do a video before literally lawyers do a video who know way more about this stuff than I do. So hang tight. We have no rush to vote yet. I will definitely be updating you all on this. So that's it. Let's get into the video. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our, our Twitter spaces, Mining Teach-In today. Um, I'm joined by Tom DeFiore and Asher. And we're going to go over some questions from the community. Our goal today is to have a free form conversation that's not scripted on questions that we've been hearing from the community, specifically on mining. Uh, all questions that we received about the overall deal have been kicked over to the Fahrenheit team, and they're gonna address those on the next general town hall. Uh, today's just about mining and getting creditors more educated about the space and the overall plan uh, that we have with Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit and US Bitcoin. And again, it will be led by Tom, myself, and Asher from US Bitcoin. So let's go ahead and get started. First topic uh, we'd like to address is equity versus mining economics. And first question is, in order for creditors to feel confident that we are ahead enough on the efficiency curve and can survive a sharp, prolonged downturn while other miners get wiped out. Please provide a basic per Bitcoin breakdown of all expenses. We clearly have some crucial advantages and disadvantages, but want to see how we stack up relative to other major players in the market as far as costs and expenses. Number one, out of the gate, two through build out, and three, ultimately, once build out is complete and inefficiencies are addressed and corrected. My turn to go, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and that, that question was for you, Asher. Awesome. Uh, pleasure to uh, be on here today and be able to talk to everyone. And as Scott mentioned, really want to use this opportunity to just answer and kind of have an open conversation, just talk through everything live as questions come in. I know. A lot of people are focusing on mining because that's a big part of the operations of Nuco and want to kind of have confidence in that business and the strategy. So I think, Scott, to your question, I'm going to answer it from kind of two perspectives. One is from a creditor and potential future shareholder of Nuco. And then two is the actual mining business itself and its competitiveness and economics. So I think as a future shareholder of Nuco, um, you are turning potential credits into shares of this new company that the goal is to have traded on the NASDAQ, right? And we're currently going through the regulatory steps and the processes to ideally get to that outcome. And so when you think about what is the value that I will receive as a part of NUCO, there's three key pillars, 
right? One is the mining business and the assets that the company currently owns. Two is the Ethereum and the staking involved there. And then third is the other illiquid assets that our team is going to basically on the Fahrenheit side, be able to turn um, and be able to bring value to. And so I wear two hats, one as a principal, as a part of the Fahrenheit group, and second as a leader of U.S. Bitcoin, which is going to be a servicing partner of NUCO. And so when you think about as a shareholder of NUCO, what matters most in terms of the value that you receive, right? Because you're going to be owning a share of a public company, so you're going to be owning a stock. And the question is, what does the market perceive that is going to happen to Bitcoin and more specifically Bitcoin mining? And so today you can Google, there's probably about a dozen public companies both traded on the New York, on the NASDAQ or on New York Stock Exchange or in the Canadian markets or internationally on like the London Stock Exchange and such. And so it's really important because a lot of what I've seen out there on Twitter is what is our projection on Bitcoin price? What is our projection on difficulty? And obviously in the disclosure statement, the professional has put toge- professionals have put together different sensitivities on if Bitcoin is high, if Bitcoin is low, or if hash price is high, or if hash price is low. But the reality is for an investor specifically, the value of their shares relative to kind of the enterprise or value or the market cap of the publicly traded company is based on the market's perspective of those variables, right? Because all miners are going to have to deal with the same Bitcoin price, the same difficulty adjustments that happen. And so I kind of implore everyone to look at this opportunity as what is the value of my equity and how does NUCO compare to other public companies? Right. You have some companies that are trading two and a half, three billion dollars. You have other companies trading at a billion, at half a billion and really looking and going to those companies websites and saying, OK, this company is trading at this valuation. What go to each one of their websites? They all have a live exahash number of how many exahashes they have online. Monthly, they usually have production reports of how many Bitcoin they're producing. And you can say, OK, a company that has on average 10x a hash, which equates to about 100,000 machines, plus or minus, depending on your machine type, Um, or a company that has 50,000 machines or 5x a hash or 6x a hash, what is the market cap of that company and what is the equity value, right? Because that's going to be the biggest driver of the value for, um, for shareholders. And the reality is companies are weighed based on obviously the amount of extra hash that they have, which drives towards their top line, but also on their efficiencies. How well do they perform? How well can they operate? Do investors trust this company? How good are their unit economics? And those are other drivers of overall value, right? So I would like ideally for folks to think about this from two different perspectives. One is underwriting the actual business itself. And then two is underwriting what is the current comp of this business compared to the other publicly traded businesses and what is the potential value of the equity of NUCO, right? And that's how we think about it at Fahrenheit by the investment that we're putting in um, in the beginning as well into the business. Um, And so going more directly into the uh, question and the nuances of the mining business is today at Celsius, you have a little over 120,000 machines. And those machines are primarily basically average of an S19 Uh, J Pro machine. And so that is about a generation or so old. It's it's, uh, right under 30 joules per terahash. The newest and most efficient machines today are the XPs at about 21.5 joules per terahash. And those haven't really been deployed at scale yet because that was released when kind of the bear market started. And so there wasn't as much capital in the ecosystem um, to go and purchase and scale out those machines. And so you're still competitive when we have kind of a lot of research reports that we receive and purchase and kind of get an understanding of where the market is, we believe that the current fleet is still competitive in the kind of macro global average kind of hash rate efficiency curves of all the machines online on the network. And so immediately coming out of bankruptcy and into an emergence and being traded as a public company, the fleet is going to be a percentage of the machines currently that are self-mining. So there's four kind of own sites that are self-mining. 
And then there's a large percentage of machines that are hosted with third parties that have been structured well because unlike most hosting agreements where it's a take or pay contract, Celsius was able to basically negotiate the ability to shut down the machines if they're unprofitable at times without having to pay the cost, right? So there's a curtailment or shutdown option to basically minimize against downside. And then right now, there's a percentage share in profit, which makes sense for where we are in the market today because you're able to have a lower kind of fixed cost and you're sharing some of that upside. Because obviously, as we get closer and closer to the halving, the ETFs coming on, and ideally for all of us, when the markets run again and Bitcoin runs again, that profit piece will become more and more valuable. But the goal there then is kind of going into step two is we start vertically integrating and owning our sites and bringing the machines from third party hosting providers to our own facilities where we can drive down cost of power, where we can have more strategies around curtailment and um, where we'll be able to basically own our own destinies and um, have and drive higher margins. And so I hope that answers the question, Scott, from twofold. One is what is the potential equity value? And I implore everyone to go look at other publicly traded companies and kind of derive that decision yourself or look at the disclosure statements. And then the second is the fleet today. And the fleet today is you have a fleet of machines that is uh, competitive when you look at the global kind of hash rate um, in our projected kind of di average difficulty. And from day one, you have a lot of those machines that are hosted with third parties. And over time, those are going to be brought into self run mining sites where we vertically integrate and control the whole cost structure. So there's, there's a lot to unpack there, Asher. And, and just to summarize it, um, to make sure I got this right, you, you, you suggested to approach valuation similar to how you might value a real estate transaction through comparables that are similar, maybe not identical, to get in at, and get an idea of what people have paid for comparable, say, hash rate recently as a measure for what this stock is going to be worth. Um, in terms of getting through the build out, one advantage we have is that the hosting contracts are very defensive in, in terms of not we don't have to pay every month if it's not economic to do so. And then third, um, this business you believe should be judged by ultimately by the end state, which is the vertically integrated build out uh, of a uh, self-owned infrastructure. Is that correct? Yeah. And I think one of the big pieces, if you look historically, uh, especially kind of back in 2020 and 2021, a lot of miners raised a lot of capital to scale, right? Investors basically bet on different companies to be able to grow and scale because the size of Bitcoin mining operations today is a massive multiple of what they were back in 2020 and 2021, right? A couple thousand machines uh, was a big deal back then, where now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of machines. And many of those companies that raised capital were not able to scale efficiently, whether it be because they couldn't control their costs and it was too expensive for them to build and scale and operate, uh, whether it be because of know-how and the ability to operate sites at the scale, over leverage, so on and so forth. And I, so I think one big thing that investors are able to receive as a part of NUCO is U.S. Bitcoin is a proven operator. It has a track record of building and scaling and operating sites at the largest scales um, that exist and giving that confidence to investors that we can take that historical knowledge and talent and bring that expertise into NUCO to try to basically decrease volatility risk and execution risk and being able to be a strong partner and kind of growing and executing on that vision. And I heard you say something really important in there, Asher, and it was talking about miners blowing up that were over leveraged. Part of this question was about advantages. And I think one, one thing to highlight is that this NUCO, its advantage will be debt service won't be a cost that is in coming out of the income statement of, of what Bitcoin can be produced and kept. Yeah, so a lot of what happened with miners that went through a distress scenario or went bankrupt in some situations was basically due to the debt burdens that they took on and the debt that they took on, whether it be against the machines or the company, 
and those fixed amortization schedules, so those monthly fixed payments that they had to pay, no matter what their profit was. And when you look at kind of what happened in 2022 is Bitcoin went down, hash prices went down, and therefore profitability went down. And so the ability for many of these miners and their projections to be able to pay those monthly payments went away because their profitability went down. Right. And you basically had folks taking on a lot of capital that they had to pay back within two years, unlike a traditional mortgage where you might pay off within 30 years. And you basically had folks in a situation where they couldn't service or couldn't make their debt payments. And so as a part of NUCO, there's a couple things here. One is. Have a situation. Governance is really important because you have a situation where the creditors are going to be the largest shareholder base in the new company. And as a part of the board of directors, they will also, and as Scott, I know you guys are going through the interview process and such, but the the creditors will own the majority of the board of directors, right? With Fahrenheit having a minority. And so all decisions made from a capital allocation standpoint or a fundraising standpoint will get approved by the board that is primarily owned by creditors. And so I think that's really important where Fahrenheit can't just do whatever they want. The capital that we raise or the capital that exists that we're putting into NUCO will all have to be approved at the discretion of the board. So I think governance is really important. And I know you guys have been working really hard on finding professional board members that have a deep background on audit, on distress, on investments to be able to provide that strong governance in NUCO. So I, I want to kind of start with that because I think that was a big part of our conversations during the auction and something that you all care deeply about that we agreed with and we are being brought in to build a great business and to create equity value but the shareholder base and the majority of the shareholders are the creditors right and this is why we want to do as many spaces as we need to to answer any questions as we kind of go closer and closer into the vote um and we'll take your feedback on this the goal of this call was more specific the goal of this call is to be more candid and not to have kind of a presentation-like format, right? So that's the first. The second is NUCO has three segments, as I mentioned. You have the Bitcoin mining assets, the machines, the facilities. You have the illiquid assets that over time will become liquid. And then you have basically Ethereum or cash equivalent. And so you have a very strong balance sheet. And if you look at some of the largest kind of public miners, they all have hundreds of millions of dollars on their balance sheet in the form of cash or Bitcoin or crypto equivalent, right? And that's important because you need to be able to manage through volatility. You need to be able to opportunistically invest when the times are right. So one of the big things coming up is the halving, for example. That realistically will be a time to invest and to buy opportunities when other folks basically are going to sell because they're put into a cash crunch situation. So NUCO will have those same similarities as some of the best traded public miners because of the strong balance sheet position. And I think based on kind of the history of the company and what the creditors have gone through, we're going to take a very conservative approach towards growth and specifically debt um, to make sure that we don't put the company in a position where you basically have an imbalance between your profitability or your balance sheet cash versus kind of your servicing on the debt that you have to have. And maybe being a bit more creative on doing some more project level financing that doesn't kind of have recourse to the parent. And so I think both the industry um, ha and us have learned through what has happened uh, in the sector across the last kind of two years or so. And we'll take those learnings as we go into NUCO and be able to continue to have strong kind of fiduciary principles and guidance on how do we grow really, really aggressively to be a very strong and innovative company, but do so in a conservative manner where we're not over levering on debt and we're not taking uh, unnecessary risks that is not needed. Yes, I 100% agree. No, no, not getting caught on the wrong side of a risk we didn't have to take. Um, I, I want to move on to question number two, though, just because I know we only have an hour today. Um, and it's for the discounted cash flow analysis mentioned in Exhibit D in the disclosure statement. Using the financial pro projections in Exhibit E, how are the Bitcoin price, hash price, hash rate, and network share forecast? 
And maybe I'll stop there at that part of the question. Yeah, so I think this kind of goes to my first point a little bit is when you look at Bitcoin mining, I'm going to give kind of a quick kind of Bitcoin mining 101 for everybody is how the network was built is there's only be a, going to be a certain finite number of Bitcoin that get released into the world um, through kind of the eternity of Bitcoin, right? And every four years, we have what is called the halving, which is the amount of Bitcoin on average that's produced every basically block, which is approximately every 10 minutes, gets cut in half. And so we basically have a situation where you have 900 Bitcoin a day that's going to get it cut in half at 450 and so on and so forth. And what's happened historically, if you look at kind of the curves um, in the correlation ratios, is Bitcoin has obviously appreciated in value since kind of day one and has been able to offset the halving in terms of value when it comes to miners. And so simply put, what's really interesting here is if you have 900 Bitcoin produced every single day, and if you think about it in a perfect world, so miners dedicate their machines and their hash to a pool to basically minimize on variability risk. So you're not trying to hit a lottery ticket every time by trying to be that one miner that gets the block and gets all the coins. You instead kind of diversify and pull together with people to minimize risk. And so kind of making it very simple, if you have 900 Bitcoin a day, and you have 900 equal people that are mining. Um, everyone has one machine. That one machine has the same amount of efficiency, same amount of terahash, hash, and they're all mining. In theory, everyone gets one Bitcoin a day, right? Alternatively, if you have 900 Bitcoin a day and you have 9,000 people mining for that 900 Bitcoin a day in an equal world where everything's balanced and you have the same efficiency, same machines, everyone gets 0.1 of a Bitcoin a day. And so... Why that is important is because Bitcoin mining is all relative. And so maybe the analogy I'll use is like oil and gas, right? Oil and gas, the lowest cost operator is the one that always wins. Because when oil gas prices run, there's a lot more oil companies coming in and they basically start drilling for oil and then supply and demand kind of corrects. And the person who is always has the cheapest cost of production is able to basically be there when you have a lot of profitability and when you have a little bit of profitability, because it's just a matter of how big your margins are, not a matter of if your cost is more than you're getting in revenue, where some people, it costs them more to mine um, or more to drill for oil. And thus, they can only do it when it hash prices or oil prices are at a certain price. And so I think when you think about the value of NUCO, and when you look at different kind of publicly traded companies, or when I do at least, you think about how strong are they relative to their peers, right? In, in scale, do they have economies of scale where they're able to basically drive efficiencies and cost? Do they have strong energy? And so when you look at kind of the breakout of mining, you have CapEx, which is the initial investment you have to make in order to actually deploy and build mining. And then you have OPEX, which is your operational cost to run it on any given day. And so from a CapEx perspective, if you're buying the infrastructure as well, I mean, 60, 70 percent of your cost is in the machines and then the rest is in infrastructure. But alternatively, if you look at your operating costs, you're, basically the majority is in energy costs and the rest is in OPEX. Right. And so I think when you focus very deeply on, hey, what's going to be Bitcoin price? What's going to be? The network difficulty, what you're not acknowledging is that every other miner that you're competing against, both that are publicly traded, that are not globally, has to deal with the same metrics. If Bitcoin is at 60,000, if it's at 10,000, everybody has to deal in that same landscape. So then the real question is, how competitive are you relative to those peers? And can you stay alive when others can't? And that's kind of driving towards how low can you bring your cost of capital? How low can you bring your operational costs and strategies in order to grow more efficiently than others? And one really other important thing to note is your control of how you mine and when you mine. So it's not binary that I'm mining 24-7 every single day, every single hour of the day. It's depending on the site, depending on the profitability of that moment in time, am I mining or am, not, am I not mining relative to the network? And so um, I guess, Scott and Tom, I think that's really important. I know we've had a lot of discussions about that, but really kind of 
thinking and saying, okay, and I'll give another analogy. Again, I'm simplifying these ideas because I know there's a broad range of people on this call who know a lot or don't know a lot about mining. But another example is if you have Bitcoin at 30,000 and you have a set difficulty, and then let's just say Bitcoin drops from 30 to 15,000, but let's just say also 50% of people that were mining are now no longer profitable and the difficulty also drops by 15%, your revenue actually stays the same, right? Because you have 15,000, you have the same amount of blocks pre-having, right? We're saying in a scenario where it's all the same, and now you have half the amount of people that are competing with you, so your hash price actually stays the same. And so that's like a really important piece to note. And as we're looking at MUCO, as in if we're looking at the long-term strategy, is how do we continue to position this company to be extremely conservative. And the reality is if the market believes that Bitcoin is going down to 5,000 and mining won't be profitable and everyone's going to get hurt, then that would be reflected in the valuation of all of the public miners, right? And so that's what really drives the equity value is one, how strong of you as the, are you as an operator and as a business? And two is what is the market's perspective on this industry because most investors invest in Bitcoin mining companies because of its ability to be a levered exposure to Bitcoin itself. Asher, in, in that explanation, I heard you reference operational expense or OPEX. And I think back to the initial slide deck that the Fahrenheit team put out with a historical OPEX figure for U.S. Bitcoin. Can you describe what goes into that? I believe it was 40 sure. some... Sure. $40, between 40 and $50 per megawatt. Sure. So the biggest kind of components when you're looking at OPEX and we're not, you're not taking kind of depreciation schedules and amortization schedules, if you just look at kind of fixed, uh, I mean, like raw kind of variable costs associated with mining, the largest category of expenses is energy. And energy is broken down into a couple of different pieces, right? You have your supply side of the energy, which is what is your actual cost of raw electrons? And then you have your transmission and distribution, which is, all right, electrons you purchased. Now you actually have to get those electrons from wherever they were produced to get them to your facility and into your miner. And what is the cost of that? Basically, if you think about it, it's like a toll road, right? When you're driving from point A to point B and you're driving on a freeway that charges a toll, what is your cost to actually get from point A to point B? So that's kind of your transmission and delivery. So the largest cost... I would say of Bitcoin mining in the sector is your energy cost. And that's why when you think about it, you, our business is not really just we're mining Bitcoin. We're really creating agile and curtailable data centers that are able to basically trade around electricity. And you're as much of an energy basically consumer and provider as you are a Bitcoin miner. And so, I mean, that was one of the main reasons that Bitcoin mining was really interesting for me and kind of how I got into the space was because there's so much renewable and there's so much development being created for power in the U.S. And in some places, you basically have all of this development of energy, but there's not enough supply or you have renewables that are creating intermittent power uh, production, right? The wind blows not 24-7. The sun doesn't shine all the time. And so you basically have jolts of when power is produced at really high levels and then when it comes down again. And so as a Bitcoin miner, it's really interesting because when there's an abundance of power on the local grids or the nodes that you're there, you can consume all that power. And it's probably pretty cheap at that moment because there's an abundance of it, obviously supply and demand. But then at the same time, if the wind stops blowing, the sun stops shining, and now you don't, you have base load power that's there and you don't have as much supply or as much production, but you have a lot of people that need it, like Texas kind of during the summers, then you have the ability to actually shut down and give that allocation back into the grid. And so what you're doing there is two things, right? One is you're actually being a good actor and you're helping the grid stabilize and balance the supply and demand curves. And so I'm a big believer that that is what is helping kind of the transition of renewables by being able to create a contracting on the supply side of wind and solar to on the demand side with kind of an agile data center. But at the same time, from an economic perspective, if you're participating in ancillary services, 
where the grid will pay you to be on standby. It's basically like an insurance policy that they're paying for you to shut down when they need you to shut down so there's not too much stress on the grid. Or if you've locked in power and hedged power and you sell that power back into the grid, you basically shut down, but you're also making money from selling power, right? And I know Celsius, uh, we did that with the fleet basically this past summer in the last month or two, and there was a lot of economics gain from doing that. And um, you see that kind of across the ecosystem. And so going back to your question, which is OPEX, the majority of OPEX is energy. And what is your strategy around managing that energy? And then you have basically site level expenses, which is roughly um, all in site level. You So the employees on site, the infrastructure on site, transformers, electrical voltage infrastructure, and then every miner today in its current form, you basically have a case around the miner. You have three ASIC chips in there. You have a control board and you have a power supply, right? And so as things break, you need to fix them and you need to repair them just like any computer or a car or anything that has um, electronics and moving objects. And so that, those are the components that make up your cost of operating. And one thing that we agreed to, because we do believe we're one of the most efficient kind of operators in the space, we agreed as a part of our servicing agreement with NUCO on the US Bitcoin side that we would cap operational expenses and salaries for every 100 megawatts at $2 million. And anything that goes above that, that we would actually come out of pocket and have that basically be deducted from our management fees. So not only did we basically talk about our efficiencies, we kind of put our money where our mouth was and basically put guarantees in our agreements to um, be to for, like to make sure that we executed and gave insurance to UCO as well. And that was really important to us. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. That that willingness to stand shoulder to shoulder and, and take a risk with us. And if if it, if the deal doesn't come out the way we strike it, you know that, that it comes out uh, of your end. I thought that was a really powerful statement. Um, and in what you said there, there was quite a bit. People have asked specifically about power costs. And, and just to restate it, historically, U.S. Bitcoin, all in to include running the site and the cost of power, has been able to achieve under five uh, cent per kilowatt hour costs. And you've done that at scale. And that level of efficiency, what I heard, to refer to what you said earlier, is, is how you survive a halving or a price adjustment. As the market corrects, that level of efficiency is, is how... a public Bitcoin miner remains profitable. Um, and then in terms of, of the, the energy market, it, one, one thing that I did want to point out just for, for folks is that an energy market, an energy grid has to function at equilibrium as well, which is why a Bitcoin miner is so such a crucial resource for a power grid because it can't be oversupplied and it certainly can't be undersupplied but I otherwise thought it was a really good explanation. I, I did want to note, we do have, we do see, we have some hands up there. Uh, we wanted to get through as many of these questions as we could though. Um, so just moving forward, Asher, can you provide information on the relationship U.S. Bitcoin and soon to be new hut on the last town hall, U.S. Bitcoin sounded like a contractual service provider to Nuco. However, Nuco's proposed CFO, Joel Block, and you, Asher, are currently executive leaders of U.S. Bitcoin. Yeah, do you want me to answer now, Scott, or is there more to that question? Um, well, it, there, there's more. And what is Arrington Capital's relationship to U.S. Bitcoin and or New Hunt? Got it. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess I'll break that into parts. Um, I, I assume that's what you're doing then. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So part one, which is HUD8 versus US Bitcoin. So HUD8 and US Bitcoin announced uh, in February, basically a merger of equals, right? Where the two companies would come together and merge into one company, which is the publicly traded company today that's on the NASDAQ and uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange, which is uh, ticker is HUT, H-U-T, right? So that's the publicly traded company. Um, and upon closing of that merger, we'll form into one business um, and basically it was an equal share. So them plus us equals 
basically the new business. And our goal was one plus one would be greater than two in terms of value that we drive to our ultimate shareholders. HUD-8 is primarily um, in in Canada and all of their operations are in Canada. And then U.S. Bitcoin is in the U.S. and all of our operations are in the U.S. And HUD-8 also has a diversification strategy into traditional data centers as well um, in their Terrago acquisition. And so they're part minor, part um, traditional data center operators. And so on the U.S. Bitcoin side, it's really interesting because we really have three different streams of revenue. One is our asset management strategy, which is we hold Bitcoin on the balance sheet. We have investments that we make into facilities and we have investments that we make into ASIC machines where we have self-mining exposure. Right. So that's kind of our investment arm. And they buy machines, they sell machines, they run machines and we have exposure to self-mining. The second and the third part of our business is what's really interesting because that is starting to become the largest piece basically of what our business is. We got really good at operating facilities. And when we got really good at operating facilities, we saw an opportunity because in our minds, we saw value basically in saying, okay, we will give up upside when Bitcoin runs to have kind of more downside protection, have more stable revenue streams and be able to really be the best operator and the best in class in operating these sites. And the more scale that we get, the cheaper that we can do it both for our own facilities and for our partner facilities. And so when some of these companies went bankrupt, basically, you had new owners that didn't necessarily know how to operate these facilities at scale, and they actually hired us. So it's basically like a property management strategic operator business of ours where we are hired by third parties to run and operate their Bitcoin mining facilities, right? And so today we have over 700 megawatts of assets under management, of facilities under management, making us one of the largest operators of Bitcoin mining data centers in North America. And so that's a really kind of key part of our business and key part of our growth strategy, which is where the Celsius Nuco connection comes in because Celsius Nuco will be basically another customer that we service and we operate for, and they'll get all the benefits of the technology that we've developed, the software, the IP, the economies of scale, the know-how, the knowledge on development and operations. Um, And so as a part of basically us looking at this opportunity for Nuco, what we realize is U.S. Bitcoin is really good at Bitcoin mining, or at least I believe we are, right? (laughs) It's uh, everyone has their own opinion and, and, uh, and that's fair. And so, we have a lot of conviction and confidence in our expertise and our know-how and our knowledge and our domain expertise. What we are not experts on is everything else crypto, right? We're experts in Bitcoin mining specifically. And I know Scott and Tom and other folks on the UCC, we've had conversations when you'll ask me something outside of Bitcoin mining, I'll direct you to other Fahrenheit members because I know where my strengths and expertise is. In other areas, I choose not to um, kind of give advice when I don't believe that I'm an expert in that field. And so that's how the Fahrenheit group came together was we said, how do we build a coalition of crypto experts who have had a history in diverse places of the ecosystem? And how can we come together and form one group to be able to drive Nuco, which is not just a Bitcoin mining company. It's intended to be a crypto company that has different business verticals and different exposures that shareholders can get to crypto. And so that's where Mike Arrington, who runs Arrington Capital, um, came together. And then we brought in Noah Dressa from Proof Proof, and then Ravi Kaza, and then really Steve Kokinos came in. He was uh, the CEO of Algorand, and we were talking in, in the group, and he stepped up to the plate and is the proposed CEO for Nuco to drive the growth and work closely with the board of directors. So basically, we on the U.S. Bitcoin side are a principal Fahrenheit. Joel and Joel is our current CFO, who will not be the CFO of the post-merge company because the HUD-8 CFO will continue to be CFO. And so Joel is actually moving over to Nuco and him along with Steve, Steve will be the CEO and Joel will be the CFO of Nuco. He will not have further employment with U.S. Bitcoin. Um, We'll be 100% dedicated to Nuco. And then you have the support of the Fahrenheit team, and then you have the servicing agreement on the Bitcoin side from U.S. Bitcoin. So those are the dynamics. Put it very simply in summarizing it, Joel and Steve 
will be the CFO Joel and the CEO Steve of Nuco, 100% dedicated, sole focus. Then you have the broader Fahrenheit group, which is us, Steve, Arrington Capital, Proof Group, and Ravi. And those folks will drive strategy as a part of Nuco and bring in other management to run the business. And then thirdly, you have US Bitcoin as the service operator that executes on the Bitcoin business and operates, but the decision-making and the capital allocation strategy will come from the executive team and ultimately be decided by the board of directors that is going to be majority controlled by creditors. Thanks, Asher. That just want to make a note, we're at 40 minutes past the hour and read question number four here is there there's a certain number of provisions in the Fahrenheit bid and the plan sponsor agreement capping infrastructure build out costs and transferring profit sharing agreements with minor ASIC manufacturers. Um, is there an analysis of the of the value of these? Can you provide the key contractual terms provided to allow creditors to undertake an independent analysis of their value? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, if anyone has had an opportunity, because I know we're doing this on spaces, so there's not slides and stuff to share. But if anyone has had an opportunity, if you go to the Fahrenheit Twitter, we did a uh, Zoom kind of presentation about this a couple weeks ago. And there's actually a slide that shows this, but I'm going to talk through it verbally. But if you want to see actually a visual representation, you can go to that recorded Zoom link and you should be able to see it. But basically the idea, so there, there's, there's a couple things we're contributing here, right? Uh, two of them were, we had two of the manufacturers basically support us in the bid. And one of them gave us a $100 million coupon and said, you can apply this towards future purchases. Um, and there's a cap of what you can apply per order, but basically giving us competitive advantages on future purchases. The second was more of kind of a strategic partnership. And the idea is, as I mentioned earlier, a majority of the capital spent initially when building out a fully vertically Bitcoin mining facility is on the ASIC chip, on the miner itself. And so the thought process we had was, OK, what's a way where we can reduce the CapEx we spent on miners and be able to have more leverage on our capital and more capital efficiency to drive growth. And so basically what the strategic partnership is, is instead of you historically spending, call it two thirds of your capital on a miner, and then one third of your capital on, a, um, on your infrastructure, instead now you can put all of that capital into building infrastructure, right? To be building data centers. And so instead of getting one unit, because if you think about it, if there's in total, you have three dollars, two dollars have to go into buying miners. One dollar has to go into buying infrastructure. Again, these are based on kind of some of the market rates that we had, et cetera, but kind of rough numbers. Now, if you spend all three dollars and you go buy infrastructure, now you have three times the amount of infrastructure you would have otherwise. Right. So the question is, OK, great. I have a bunch of infrastructure, but I don't have miners. So what's the use in that? And so what this kind of manufacturing strategic partnership brings is they're going to fill up the whole data center with miners. And so it's like, okay, cool. I have three times the amount of infrastructure that I would have otherwise. And now all of that rack space is filled with someone else's miners. And it's like, okay, how does that help me? So what the partnership is, is basically by the start of the first day, you get a 30% split of all the machines. Then by the end of year one, in the start of year two, you now own 40% of all of those machines. And then at the end of year two and at the start of year three, you own 50% of those machines. So now kind of using those simple numbers again, instead of me basically spending $2 on machines and $1 on infrastructure, and let's just say I build 10 megawatts for a simple example, now I can spend all $3 on infrastructure. So instead of 10 megawatts, I can get 30 megawatts. So you get three times as much infrastructure. And instead of my $2 being spent to own 10 megawatts of ASICs, right? Because the original example is you invest, you have 10 megawatts, you own 10 megawatts of machines all yourself. But now you have 30 megawatts of infrastructure. So you have three times the amount of infrastructure. And if everyone kind of doesn't know this, like 
infrastructure you can depreciate over a much longer period of time because you're not having these efficiency increases year over year, et cetera, right? A traditional transformer you can depreciate over five, 10, 15 years. And so you now have 30 megawatts of infrastructure and in this strategic partnership, you own 15% of it. So now you own 15 megawatts of, infra of miners um, that you own and then another 15 megawatts that you host. So if you look at the end scenario of the 10 megawatt example, you have 10 megawatts of infrastructure and 10 megawatts of miners that you own. And then in scenario two, you have 30 megawatts of infrastructure, 15 megawatts of miners that you own, and another 15 megawatts of miners that you host, and you make a little bit of margin on. And so for the same dollar that you deploy, you get a lot more in return. And so you have a lot of basically leverage without taking the risk of like traditional debt, right? You don't take that risk factor, but you get the capital efficiency and you get to be able to deploy more efficiently than ideally your competitors, then that ideally will drive more equity value to Nuco. That makes okay. a lot of sense to me. Um, I wanted to kick it over to Tom. Sure. I was, I was going to start the next round of questions. I see, I see Simon has his hand raised. Let's, let's call Simon up to the stage uh, and see what he has to say before we go into the next round of questions. So, okay. Uh, Simon should be coming on any second now. Simon, when you, when you can. Hi, guys. Ask Hey, hey, Simon. How you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, sorry, I thought you were going to do all your questions first. I was just putting my hands up to get in the queue. But... I think I think we have too many questions. So yeah. I only, unfortunately, have an hour today. I told the guys that we can hop on tomorrow over the weekend or in the future as well. We really want to kind of address everyone's questions. But I know we didn't get through nearly as many as we wanted to today. So we can have a couple more of these. But wanted to make sure it wasn't all just pre kind of send questions that we can do some of these live. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I, I was going to ask just to get a bit of a sense, Sasha and guys on um, what you, th so obviously halving next year, um, all the difficulty adjustments and everything you covered earlier, I missed the beginning. So I'll go back and to the recording, but um, how do you see about the, the, the long, long term with mining in terms of, you know, what, as we transition more to transaction fees, one of the long term debates, is, which has just come back to the service, has been things like around drive chains. And more recently, we've had ordinals giving more uh, transaction fees in blocks and stuff. Um, just wondering if like just to hear your general thoughts, Asher, around like some of these these adjustments towards um, as the block rewards get lower. Do you think it's going to be a continued efficient market and adjustment or do you? and the transition to transaction fees. Have we got, you know, a multi-decade strategy where we can put all this to work? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. So I guess I, I think about this from two perspectives, right? One is from kind of macro Bitcoin hash price, which is our top line. And then the other is from more our competitive strategy and moat. Because as you know, uh, we have till 2140 until the last Bitcoin is went, so we do have a long time. But the question is, every four years, that becomes harder and harder. So what does that actually mean, right? Um, so I think from kind of, if I look at top line and different parts of the business, first, specifically on kind of uh, the, the blocks excluding transaction fees, everyone has their own thesis of what happens to Bitcoin. You can look at what happened historically in Bitcoin right around the halving, over a certain period of months, you see kind of a doubling in Bitcoin price and you can look at kind of historical data, but historical data also doesn't predict future results, right? So I would be crazy to say, hey, this is my belief and this is what I'm betting on that Bitcoin's going to double and it's all going to be good. And, and that's, that's not fair. But I do think there is historical precedent there and there is more and more macro traction. You have kind of the ETFs being approved um, and you have a couple of these aim to go live before the halving happens. So I think you'll have kind of positive market uh, growth in, in, in direction and, and, and adoption. In regards to transaction fees, um, so two things here. One is Ordinal's huge fan, uh, Luxor, which is a mining pool, has been really been at kind of the forefront of those. Uh, they're close and dear friends, and um, we kind of love what they're doing on that side. And it's funny, when we did the merger with HUD-8, I had an opportunity to kind of sit down and have lunch with Michael Saylor as well. And it was the same thing as how do miners come together, drive more application layers on top of the Bitcoin network to basically drive more transaction fees and more users and more adoptability, right? And so I think when you think about Muco, the beauty about it is on US Bitcoin, we're a simple business. 
We operate and we build Bitcoin mining facilities and post-merger with HUT, we are an operator of infrastructure, both for digital assets and for traditional assets like data centers and AI technologies, right? That's our business. In UCO, we are really pushing the adoption of digital assets and cryptocurrency. So we have exposure to infrastructure through the mining side of the business, but it's how we continue to drive different use cases and different applications on the application layer, whether that be on Ethereum, which there's already a lot of kind of uh, projects on there, and more and more on, on Bitcoin, right? And I think by doing so, by driving more use cases on the Bitcoin network, you drive more on the transaction fee. And I think that's a beautiful scenario where all miners are on the same team and they're aligned and they're not competing against each other. So I think the ordinals is just really the start of transaction fees. Right now you have kind of some of this hype, you have these different gifts and emojis, et cetera. But what if you were able to lock in things that you really want to keep track of? And I'm kind of borrowing some of uh, this language from um, podcasts that I've listened to, but what if someone wanted to really put in something like their will? Would they pay a hundred dollars in transaction fees or even a thousand if they could put their will onto the blockchain, have it locked in so it couldn't be adjusted and it was forever ingrained? Probably, right? And so I think there will be more and more use cases of what can go on to the Bitcoin network. I think it kind of has been proven over and over again that Bitcoin is one of the strongest and most powerful and most safe blockchains, especially because of the proof of work behind it. And so we're believers that you'll see more adoption there. So that's one side of like, how do we think about long term post having what's going to happen with the network and this conversation of oh no, the halving's come, coming, everyone's going to get destroyed. I mean, happens every four years, right? We've been through this, happens every four years. There will be volatility. There will be kind of rocky roads during the halving, but it's how do you prepare? And that's why a part of NUCO, having a strong balance sheet, being able to shut down the machines when they're not profitable and not continue to have to pay the bill, those are all things that we have structured as a part of NUCO to make sure it's prepared to not only survive but to be able to thrive and acquire and grow during periods of volatility. So then that goes to my second point of like, you can, there's things that you cannot control, which is what's gonna happen to Bitcoin, what's gonna happen to transaction fees. You can be very educated and understand the trends and understand where they're going and have optimism or pessimism about kind of where the future is going and we're optimistic. And then there's a second, which is what you can control, which is how do you manage your power? How do you manage your balance sheet strategy, your debt strategies to make sure that when times get tough, because they will. I mean, for all the folks that are listening that have been through crypto, it's a roller coaster. It's the highs of highs and the lows of lows. But the, the real thing as you're operating these businesses is during the lows of lows, how do you stay alive? How do you get through? And in an ideal world, how do you grow during those periods of time? And then during the next high of high, you're bigger than ever, right? And so that's kind of how we think about it and bringing people with different and diverse perspectives, i.e. via Fahrenheit, i.e. via the, the board of directors to drive those opinions, to drive that diversity of thought, to create a holistic strategy that ideally covers most of the scenarios that we'll be encountered with and that we've been proactive in protecting ourselves to do so. All right, Asher, I, I, we're going to we're going to head to the next set of questions. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to uh, to, to question number two, um, and we, we're going to try to go lightning round because we have a lot more questions and, and uh, not not enough time to get to them. Can you compare the energy costs of our self miners versus the costs associated with hosting agreements? Yeah, sure thing. So um, you, you'll see this on the disclosure statements as well. Uh, so on the self-mining side, you have the current sites that we, we run um, in, in West Texas, right? And so, as I mentioned before, there's a supply side of energy, and then there's a transmission delivery. So on the supply side in West Texas, it's a really interesting environment. And I know we don't have much time today, so maybe I won't geek out and go too much into the nuances. But you have a scenario where you have a lot of production at times because of renewable assets, not necessarily a lot of demand. And so you have basically these really high peaks and these really low lows. So if you look at West Texas, um, and so from an energy perspective, if you look at basically the uh, the ERCOT kind of West low zone so far this year, 
If you look at the real-time prices, on average over the last seven months, you've been at like 5.39, so call it 5.4 cents. But the beauty with Bitcoin mining is because you have so many of these peaks when you don't have wind blowing, you don't have the sun shining, if you curtailed the site only 8% throughout the year, you drop that average supply cost of power from 5.4 cents to 2.48 cents. So instead of paying about 5.5 cents, you're paying about 2.5 cents. And that's curtailing only 8% of the time whenever the power is over 9 cents. Right? And so that's what's really interesting um, in West Texas. So right now, we have these four sites that are, um, that are self-mining sites. We're using a utility substation, so we pay a bit more for the transmission and delivery. Right now, we're looking at other facilities that ideally we can even kick off before the company goes out of bankruptcy to basically own the substation and to be able to drop down that transmission and delivery um, and be able to have even kind of a lower overall cost. So that's kind of category one of self-mining. Category two of hosted third parties. Um, so historically, if you look at kind of the markets, I would say the average hosting rate today is somewhere between seven and eight cents. The route that kind of Celsius has taken that is going to go into Nuco is basically working with the partners to say, hey, why don't you give us your cost of production, your energy and your operations, and we do a profit share. So we'll share the profit with you, but we want a lower basis cost because right now, Bitcoin mining, we're, more, we're in a bear cycle. We'd rather have a lower base and share some of the upside rather than have a higher base where we can kind of get squeezed, right? But on top of that, not only do we want that, we also want the ability to shut down our machines if we're unprofitable. And that's key because that's usually not a part of kind of traditional hosting agreements is usually take or pay. You either use it or you pay for it. And so on average, you kind of have between a 10 to 30, 40% kind of profit share um, range there. Um, and so I would say kind of if you look at the model and the disclosure statement, you have high, high, third, high kind of three to four cents um, on the kind of self-mining side. So you have kind of between, between four to five cents on the self-mining side. And then on the hosting side, you're at between, call it, six to eight cents. Um, and one other thing that I do want to address that we can hear, I don't know um, if anyone's going to ask it, but I've seen a couple of questions out there regarding kind of the alpha facility, and I want to kind of dispel any kind of rumors or thoughts there. The structure that is at the alpha facility, so we signed a contract with Celsius for 8,500 machines. That was a part of our term sheet on the U.S. Bitcoin side, and that was meant to match the stocking horse bid, right? Because the other stocking horse bidder who won the stocking horse bid basically offered a contract for eight, for machines. And we said, you know what? If you choose us, we want to make sure those machines still have a home. So we'll match those terms. And just so everyone's clear what those terms are, we have a 30% profit share. And what that means is that after costs of energy and of operations, we have 30% of the profit. It's not 30% of the revenue, right? And I think that's where a lot of the confusion is. And so the way that the deal is structured is if we have 100% of the revenue, we get 30% of the revenue. Celsius gets 70% of the revenue. However, they only have to pay the bill on their 70%. They don't pay the bill on the full 100%. So it's a 70, our only margin is the seventy is the thirty percent profit share because everything else is passed through at cost for that contract. And just sorry, real quick, another point to that is originally it was a three year agreement, and we agreed to do a five year agreement. But after the auction, another thing we agreed to that the UCC asked for was an ability at different points in the contract to get out. Because the goal of NUCO is not to host with third parties. The goal of NUCO is to build our own facilities and to vertically integrate. And so US Bitcoin's like, we understand that goal. And instead of locking you to a five-year agreement, when you decide you want to leave, we can let you leave at different points in the contract um, rather than a five-year fixed agreement, no matter what, even if Bitcoin runs. Um, because really, the reason why the profit share makes sense for a hosting provider is not in today's market, because we can go get seven and eight cents and probably even do better. 
But instead, it really works when Bitcoin starts running and that 30% is a lot more valuable. And Nuco has the ability to cancel that agreement and bring it to their own sites when that time comes. All right. This sort of leads into my next question here. Question four is uh, Cedarvale, Texas. Is the site being acquired from Core Scientific? Can you tell us more about the site? How many megawatts? Uh, is it a member of ERCOT? Costs, et cetera. Does it come with miners or is it the site only? Sure. So uh, Core had a disclosure statement that kind of mentioned this. We're currently in negotiations with them and looking at other uh, two other facilities as well, kind of speaking transparently. And so that deal is not done. It's a deal that we're in conversation with um, and we're looking at other opportunities in addition to that as well. And so that deal specifically is a multi hundred megawatt facility. It has its own private substation. So you reduce the cost on transmission and delivery and it's ERCOT approved. So we can go in and we can deploy and we can build very quickly. And I think the confidence that is given to um, NUCO is on the US Bitcoin side, another thing that we kept ourselves accountable for on top of operating costs in the $2 million cap. In addition, what we have also done is put a cap for build out costs. So our build out costs are pretty competitive relative to the market. So we capped our build out costs at $395,000 for build out. A lot of other miners you'll see have built for $500,000, dollars $700,000. And so anything over $395,000, it comes out of our pocket and our management fees and gets deducted from that um, for that given year. And so for the first 400 megawatts, um, I want to make sure we're kind of clear and I'm not um, saying anything that's uh, not accurate. And so that's important because for every 100 megawatts, if we can save $100,000 a megawatt or $200,000 a megawatt, that's 10 to $20 million alone on every 100 megawatts built. So when we're looking at a multi hundred megawatt project and we want to make sure we build it quickly, we build it with high quality and we're able to control the cost. That's another massive piece of protection that we're providing. Right. On the U.S. Bitcoin Manning management side, we're talking a 15 million dollar management fee. And on the other side, the risk we take on is if we're building hundreds of megawatts, every 100 megawatts, if we slip by hundred thousand dollars a megawatt or two hundred thousand that's ten to twenty million dollars so we're taking tens of millions of dollars of risk on our fees um if we don't execute because we really wanted to basically stand behind our words and some of these protections that we gave as a part of our auction were our goals to do so all right i know i know we're coming up on time um kelly did did we have any extra time for questions or we have to, i know we have a pretty hard stop yeah, I think we're losing Asher. Asher, if you want to give five minutes for a question or two, if they come in, or we can hold these for the next time. Yeah, let's do a question or two. I do have to hop, unfortunately. But again, as I mentioned, I'm happy to make myself available and to do more of these. Again, really want to answer questions for the community. And whatever they are, happy to answer them and kind of talk through them and try to educate. So my, my question is really about execution. Um, I understand that you're going through a merger. And you also have the large undertaking of a potential build out, whichever site that you, um, you know, uh, decide on. And, um, and then, you know, you're taking on a new client and uh, what have you. Um, uh, so my, my question really is, it's two parts. Um, number one, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's a, um, a few headwinds. Uh, one of them, the largest one, in my opinion, and I have a 10 year career in the semiconductor space. So my question is, you know, regarding the ASICs, you mentioned that you have a partnership with ASIC and that gives you direct line of access to their chipset, uh, for the bit mining, uh, for the, for the miners. Um, you know, this is a brand new operation. You will be kind of in line with the likes of an Apple, uh, you know, various other IoT companies. Uh, you name it, right? Uh, what gives you? What, what makes now? Now, I, my question is: What makes um, U.S. Bitcoin get ahead of that queue? Because there is a shortage globally. And uh, secondly, um, you know, how do you undertake all these different headwinds altogether and then deliver? Uh, you know, to the satisfaction of your potential new client? Yeah, most definitely, and I appreciate the question. Uh, so in terms of kind of scope and responsibilities, we already have the customers that we operate. We actually are not taking on new customers until we kind of stabilize this business. And so we've had a couple opportunities that we've decided basically not to move forward on 
to make sure that we have enough bandwidth and that we're actually executing on the promises that we make because we're only as good as our word and our reputation, right? And so from that perspective, the merger with HUD8 is more of a kind of corporate financial merger, not necessarily from an operation perspective. And so our operating team that is going to be doing the development, the build out, the efficiency uh, adjustments, that is a team that has been preparing for this business since the beginning of the auction. And so when you talk about the large site that we're going to build, the goal is for us to build that for NUCO and to prepare NUCO to be the most efficient and to be as strong as possible coming out of bankruptcy. And so we've already allocated and dedicated the resources in order to execute and do our job here. Also in our contract as a part of NUCO, and this was added after the auctions, we actually also have SLAs that are specific services that we have to provide. And if not, NUCO has the ability to basically cancel their agreement, right? And so we're putting in protections. So it's not just taking our word for it. We're putting in financial penalties if we don't execute on what we've said. Um, and then specifically kind of pivoting a bit. So we have confidence in our ability to basically execute, to grow, to operate, and to build um, on behalf and for NUCO. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the first part of the question. Second on the semiconductor piece. So I hear you look, if you look back at 2021 kind of height of COVID while we were building and scaling, I mean, you had a massive, massive supply chain shortage, right? Specifically kind of the five and three nanometer chips at the time, not the sevens. And you had cars that didn't have the chips. And again, TSMC is the primary driver of these chips right now. We kind of have seen the supply chain shortage be a bit better, um, especially kind of for the five nanometer chips, the people are getting allocation on the three and kind of the two nanometer chips are the new ones that are coming out and being tested on. And so if you look at the kind of three main manufacturers in our space, Bitmain, Micro, PT, and Canon, um, in 2021, even when they had really tight allocation, we were always able to procure machines and at a fair price. And that that's what allowed us to scale. If we look at where we are today, we have a very strong relationship with all three. Anyone can reach out to them, and I'm sure they would tell you the same. We're a large customer. Again, this is the whole element of scale. The more scale we have, the better it is for us and for all of our partners and customers, right? And so, um, and then there's other competitors that are coming out now as well um, that we've had conversation with and looking at, at their takeouts. And so the important thing to note, like the three, I would say, kind of main suppliers of chips, number one, the biggest giant is TSMC, and then you have Samsung, and then you have SMIC. And so across kind of the three manufacturers, Bitmain, MicroBT, and Canon, you have diversification of who their foundries are. So not all of them procure from the same. All three actually have different fabs with all three different manufacturers. And that allows us to have diversity in our ability to procure these chips and to be able to scale. Even if one has more of a bottleneck than others, we're able to ebb and flow um, to be able to grow based on kind of the needs and capital allocation strategies that we have. And, and will you be able to meet that timeline is, is really the question. Um, well, which timeline are you referencing specifically? Um, like, for instance, uh, you know, uh, well, what is your timeline? <laughs> I yeah, guess so that's a better question. I, I think the goal right now is you have 122,000 machines that the goal is how do we get all of those machines plugged in, right? Because you still have some of them that are not plugged in in warehouses. How do we get them plugged in? How do we get them to be the most efficient, optimize them possible. So I think before we can go on and think about growth and buying more machines, is how do we make sure what we have today operates best in class? And I think that's step one. And we've already been working, and I guess Tom and Scott can attest to this. I mean, I'm on calls with them all the time now, but we've already started putting work to try to drive that even pre-emergence. And that's step one, and then um, growing into step two. And so as, as we're looking at these larger site builds with basically the UCC and the company and the debtors, um, some of that capacity will be for expansion, whether it be through new machines or the ASIC partnership. All right. I, I think, I think that's going to close us out. I know, I know Ash has got to go. I want to thank you for your time, everyone who joined us. Um, on behalf of Fahrenheit and the UCC, we, we thank you for your time. And just want to mention that Fahrenheit Group is going to be announcing uh, a broader discussion. So please submit your questions for that once they request it. And we'll, we'll address some of the questions that we couldn't get to in the, in the time today. Um, again, thank you for your time. And uh, I don't know if you had anything additional to add, Scott. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. And just a couple of things I wanted to highlight that we went over. People are very focused on costs. I think that 
know, while we didn't answer every individual question, we, we did do a dive into historical operational expenses, uh, a new site, historical cost in, in that region in, in ERCOT. I think that it will be very helpful to answer all of, all of those questions. And, you know, going through the, the caps that are in the agreement that we made with the Fahrenheit group, you know, generally you hire a contractor, good, fast, cheap, you can pick two if you're lucky. These guys agreed to all three and, it, and it's in writing. And I think that was a really powerful part of how we got here. And in any case, I know we got to wrap it up and we will have a, another space in the future to address all of the unanswered questions. Really appreciate everyone being here today and for all of your time uh, that you took out of your days to listen to us.